Welcome to episode 201 of the Barcelona Podcast, home to the most influential voices in the FC Barcelona community. Brought to you by the Blue Wire Podcast Network and sponsored betonline.ag. Hit that subscription button to be first to listen to the hottest takes on the biggest stories coming out of the Camp Nou. I'm Dan Hilton, and I'm again joined by Frances Tomas, Barca columnist featured on ESPN, Barca Black, and many others. Frances, we were positive after Athletic Club, but I guess that didn't last long. Hola, culés. No, I didn't. Um, but then again, you know, we haven't really won convincingly at all since La Liga restarted. To be honest, we weren't winning convincingly before the Liga was stopped because of the COVID pandemic. And um, yeah, the result at Celta does really not help. No, you know, in this game, it's almost it's funny to me that the script for this game almost worked out exactly how you would expect a game against Celta to go. We knew that in recent history, these games have been pretty wide open, uh, whether it was at the Camp Nou or where it was for this one in Galicia. And into the game, you knew that the big man for Celta de Vigo, and I mean that in terms of his impact, not even his height, but Iago Aspas has scored 37.9% of Celta de Vigo's goals this year, and they've been playing well of late, but they're a team that fighting against relegation. And all that said, you knew that they were going to come with a little bit of fire. They wanted to open up Barca, but I think a tactical credit to them, and I think I give less and less credit as we get farther along, because it's not rocket science for these other teams that go with a 5-3-2 against Barcelona. They know that if you go with five at the back, Barca's going to, you can just be compact, put a lot of bodies around Messi, and you're going to force Barca to break you down some other kind of way. And then if you put two up top and defend in a 5-3-2, you have two guys to get out on the break and get out on the counters. And Celta has certainly did well to get out on their counters today. Yeah, for sure. I think if we've worked it out and millions of culés that um, are around the world and obviously the thousands of listeners recording this, po- this podcast have worked it out. I'm, th- I'm sure Oscar Garcia, who obviously is a La Masia graduate, former Barca player um, for many, many years, actually, he's worked it out as well. I mean, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to know that Barca tend to go through the middle. And if you can't control Messi or when he's got the ball, mean not control because you can never control Messi but to to be able to stop him drifting towards the middle and combining with normally Luis Suarez then you've got a lot of um, a lot of chances of winning the game Um, the game against Delta I think Barca have done enough to win it to be honest Uh, but then again it's clear that they could have lost it in the very last minute I mean if Nolito didn't throw the ball in the only position he would have missed it Uh, then we would be here you know not even coming away with one point I thought that Setien was brave and reasonable, I think probably more reasonable than anything, to start Ricky and Ansu, Ricky Puig and Ansu Fati. I think that with the absences in midfield in terms of injuries and banning in terms of um, Busquets, uh, with Rakitic having to play as a defensive midfielder, because uh, he's the only choice really, to be honest, um, then generated space for Ricky to play. Um, I think it's been done more out of necessity uh, than just purely on merit, as I would have liked it to be. But anyway, I thought that uh, both Ricky and Ansu were great. It was the right decision to play them. I thought they brought happiness, ambition, speed, freshness, and a quickness of thought that you know the vast majority of other players just don't have. I'm not saying no one else has the quality, but certainly they don't have the freshness of thought that, that these two seem to be adding. Um, they're always asking for the ball. Um, at times, the dif- it was difficult to do that um, because, you know, the, the, the game was getting trickier and trickier by the minute. But in difficult moments, these two youngsters um, made us proud. And, you know, there's been a lot of criticism of La Masia not producing high caliber players for a long time. I think these two um, basically are putting the foundations of better things to come in the future. Yeah, I agree. And I, I think you said it really well there that. For a long time, you and I would go and say that, oh, Valverde needs to be brave. And Setien, when he came in, he said that, oh, he's going to do things on merit and he's going to play the right players. And we saw Puj, Setien's first game in charge, going with Puj, giving him a run out there. And yeah, in this one, I think it was proven that it's not brave for Setien to have gone with Ricky Puj, particularly against Celta de Vigo. It, before, as Barca were number one in the table, not even number two, when they were number one in the table, I think it would have been reasonable just seeing how well he was, right? It's almost less credit to Setien because we don't see Ricky Puj in training every day, but he does. And so it's almost more of an indictment on Setien that he wasn't more willing to start or push with Puj earlier because it's reasonable that he makes Barca better, that Barca moved the ball well. 
until Frankie de Young comes back and, you know, that interior midfield spot is Frankie de Young's once again to, to run back into and then Pooja come off the bench, sure. But with Frankie de Young out, I mean, Pooj moves the ball better than any other midfielder that Barca has in terms of mm-hmm. with forward progression. Now, obviously, Busquets moves the ball well in the role that he plays, but it's a different position. Really, it is. I know they play in the midfield together, but it's a different position. So as, par- as far as playing that that interior, especially the left interior, Pouge does the does better there than Arthur Rakitic and Vidal. Full stop. I mean, that's what it was. We saw him move the ball well today. Sixty one of sixty six passes, but passing percentage of ninety two percent is good. That's what you expect from a Barca midfielder. Ninety two percent, or somewhere between eighty eight and ninety two. But of those sixty one passes, how many of them were something that created something forward? How many of them were diagonal balls out to Jordi Alba on the wing, uh, or how many of them were crossfield balls that well, I told you against? It was the, the match that, it's escaping my mind at the moment, but the match, or Leganes, I guess, that Frankie de Young really had a, a, he was really the only one moving the ball side to side and bypassing the lines. And that is what Pooj does with those balls, that he bypassed the line, that Vidal doesn't do that. His passes are 10 to 15 yards. Rakitic doesn't really do that either, 10 to 15 yards. So it, it, you can actually see that Pooj changes the game once again. And it's reasonable. And again, it's almost an indictment that, we know against, I don't want to jump too far ahead, we're going to preview them later, but against Atletico Madrid, with Busquets coming back in, there's a 100% chance that it's Rakitic, Vidal, and Busquets against Atletico Madrid, right? There's no chance that it's Puj. I'm not sure. I think that if you want to win the game, then you have to start Ricky, to be honest. Um, <laughs> I don't think Vidal or Rakitic can add right now what this boy can do. Um, he can move the ball around. He can be incisive. He can be... Um, I like I like how, and I know that Setien and Eder Sarabia during training they keep going about this one two one two one two basically don't take more than two touches. But what Ricky Puig does, he gets the ball if it's an easy outlet or there's an easy option, um, whether it's to the wings normally Alba or towards the middle, um, he does that as well. But I think that sometimes when he doesn't see any clear option or any advantage advantageous position for for his teammate that he's going to pass the ball to. He's happy to drive with it. He's happy to take one, two steps with the ball so that spaces open up. And he's breaking the lines in the sense that, and I don't want to hype the boy anymore, but you know, he reminds me of Andres Iniesta sometimes. If you're not, the, the ball gets to you for you to do something that's going to improve the capabilities and the possibilities of your team to move forward and score. And he breaks the line really, really well. And I don't think Rakitic or Vidal can certainly do that. Having said that, I think that Vidal right now is an unquestionable starter. Um, He's in much better shape than those around him. And I think that I just wanted to mention that because, you know, what is the bar right now? You know, you've got um, the young out injured. You've got Busquets who, you know, doesn't really have that much fewer left. Rakitic, it's, it's like all the others. There's some bursts of the player they used to be, but obviously father time is still undefeated and will forever be. So the fact that Arturo Vidal starts every match and pretty much plays them in, in full, is very, very significant of, of the stage that we're at today. Yeah, and I think you brought up a really good point there about the final. We always talk about the age and how long in the tooth the core of Barcelona is. But even in this match, as I was writing my notes, I found that I kept contradicting myself because I would say that I thought Rakitic was really good defensively in that defensive midfield spot today. And even offensively, he was doing the Busquets role really, really well. But all that said, he got cut out on, or caught out rather misplaying a ball. One of the only balls he misplayed all afternoon, he winds up misplaying a ball, and Celta immediately, Aspas delivers a nice ball in for Kuzlu, a tap-in for Samalov in front of goal. So the first goal for Celta de Vigo is a awful mistake by Rakitic, and then he's, because he's pushing forward, and he was basically parallel to Ricky Puj instead of behind him. So by misplaying that ball, he's now cut out. Umtiti, I, I don't think you even need to even mention Umtiti. I think we both agree that he was, I know you like to give out your flop of the matches on Barca Blog, but I don't think we need to talk about Umtiti. It was rough. It was a rough day for Umtiti, mm. and I don't see how he's going to, I would play Rajo over Umtiti here, or here on out. I, I think it, it was a rough day for Umtiti, and he just, he's never been right after the injuries. But anyway, he gets yes, caught out there too. He's had, he's had many of those lately, hasn't he? And, and when I say lately, he's not playing every single match. I mean, Whenever he has been trusted in the last, I don't want to exaggerate, but the last four or five months, he, it's been like that. Um, the, the, it's a mistake. You know, people make mistakes. But what I cannot comprehend is how someone who's a World Cup winner and was so good before the injury 
can lose positioning and, and not just positioning, concentration in such a such an inexplicable way. I mean, it's it's football 101. You know, the, when you start playing football, I was a, f- a fullback, and then when I became less speedy, when I, this is when I was playing myself, became a centre back, and you never ever ever leave the space to go and mark anybody, especially when you when the second line has been broken. Um, I, I don't have words to describe how stupid that was, but then again. We can't just blame one person for for right. the result because you know it was a general effort, especially defensively, that lead us to not coming away from Celta with the three points. Right, and as I said, it's those contradictions that, for as good as Rakitic was, he makes that one error that people will talk about and remember. But he also had a really good day, and then even Luis Suarez, right? Statistically, he was terrific. He only had like twenty two touches of the ball in the whole game, but yet he has two goals, two key passes, and. The goal in particular, that first goal that he scores is, or sorry, the second goal he scores, rather. The first one, obviously, is just the header recognition for a set piece from Messi that just quickly to break down. The first goal comes because Celta, for some reason, uh, they had a walkabout as far as what's going on between their ears, too, because a three-man wall, and then they put men on the post, all worrying about Messi in that way. But then they put no one directly marking Suarez. Instead, they put a body, I believe it was on Rakitic. And if you're choosing between Rakitic and Suarez, and Suarez is at the back post, and Messi's coming in with an incurling left foot, I don't know, you know what I mean? It just doesn't make sense. It seems like no. they, they were on a walkabout there. So he finishes the first with his head. On the second goal, though, so much credit to Suarez here. Rakitic to Suarez, who's taken down, but instead of complaining, which he usually does, he gets straight back up. The ball's still alive. Semedo keeps up the pressure, gets the turnover right in the penalty box, finds Messi, but there's still so much work to do when Messi lays it off to Suarez. The way that he was able to shield Araujo off the ball and let the ball then roll across his body to then finish with his, I believe it was his left foot, and he finishes in the bottom corner. It was just an awesome piece of work from Suarez on a terrific goal. And here comes the contradiction here, right? That Suarez on his two goals was awesome. He left no doubt on the two goals he scored today, which should have been enough for Barca to win. He has the brace, probably the man of the match, especially again for that piece of, uh, you know, a really good piece of skill on the second goal. But he, he, as the point of the pressure, he started to walk around in that second half. And as Barca started to lose the match, and by lose that, I mean they lose control of the match. And when Barca lose control, that's when you notice that everybody on the team is 30 plus. That's when you know that PK. You can only ask a 30-year-old to defend a 2-on-1 really well, which he did in the first half. It, it only can last so long when these 30-plus-year-old players can figure these things out, right? A 2-on-1 on a counter, or again, with Rakitic, eventually he will make one mistake, then legs will get tired, and Celta de Vigo, they brought on all their subs, they brought pressure, and they get the 2-on-2. Two two. And really, the two saves by Ter Stegen in the 80th and the 95th by Nolito, you already mentioned these, but it should have been 4-2 final. I mean, full. I mean, that's it. It, it should have been four two at the end. And Aspas, he winds up on that that free kick. Do you want to break this one down, or do you want me to break the the two two goal? No, go for it. Go for it. Yeah. So Aspas, this is the other question here that people are going to blame Griezmann because it was a five man wall with Griezmann all the way on on the one side, and he did. He made a mistake. He jumped sideways, meaning he made himself more narrow instead of wider, and he jumped towards the other players in the wall, and that allowed the ball for Aspas to go around. Now, that ball, I think, was always going to go around the wall. And so, I mean, my question there is why Barca didn't put anybody on the post. I mean, I know they wanted to mark the guys in the back, in the back, but instead of having Griezmann as that fifth man in the wall, I don't understand why that wall wasn't a little bit farther to the right because Ter Stegen would have been able to cover that and had Griezmann then on that post instead of up in a five-man wall. That was my confusion there, and you can yeah. hear that. Where I am, it's torrential downpour. I think maybe either the sky is crying for Barca or uh, they're taking a page out of the Galician book and plenty of rain here. So you'll hear that in the background. But yeah, I was just confused by it. And even the foul on Rafinha for PK, I think it was a questionable foul, but it just you can't give up those kind of positions late in the match. And Aspas, as we I said at the beginning, he scores almost 38% of the team's goals. So giving him an opportunity in that spot, that's what's going to do you in. Exactly. Um, I'm not a goalkeeper. I never have been. But um, when I've been, um, you know, I've been a teammate for many years, and obviously I was a coach for a couple of years as well. And I've never liked these walls that jump. Um, I think that if the goalkeepers put you in a position as as a part of the wall, then you just have to stay. If the ball goes straight to your face, or you know, you're near the regions, then <laughs> let it be. You know, you're there for a reason. No, in my eyes, and I always said that to all of my teammates and all of my all of my um, the kids that I coach, 
just don't jump. You know, the, the goalkeeper puts the wall there for a reason. Are we going to destroy Griezmann because he jumped sideways? No. Are we going to destroy MTT because he moved forward in the first goal? Not really. Piqué shouldn't have made that foul. Yeah, of course. But it's just, that's what I was saying. It's a continuation of little tiny mistakes that generate the, the result that we've got on today. And, and the thing is, drawing at Celta 2-2 is not a good result at all. No. It never has been and never will be. But it's made worse because of the situation that we're in in La Liga. I mean, we have come to seven matches to go and we are neck and neck with Madrid. We have been more dominant before and we haven't lost, well, 23 points away from home because we've only won 22 out of 45. Then it will be, it will be a different situation. Um, I do want to mention, because you mentioned for quite a while, um, about Luis Suarez. Suarez is there for that. You know, he's a goal scorer. He's not going to be someone who's going to be... 2015 Suarez would have, but 2020 Suarez is not going to be defensively um, aggressive. He's not going to be running. He's not going to be giving you what he used to give you. Um, but that's that's why Setien leaves him out there, to, to score and to generate these, these sparks of genius that he does from time to time. He didn't score because of his freshness. Um, he's not going to be running into spaces. He's not going to be speeding forward on the break. But he's got oficio, which is a very Spanish word, which... Uh, in English, translate to know-how, to, to reaction, reflexes, to experience. He's not going to last you 90 minutes, clearly not, but he's certainly a valid player that can do a job. Now, the key question is, and I, I think we all know the answer, is can he last 90 minutes? No, he can't. So how long do you leave Suarez on the pitch so he can actually be generating what he generates best? I would say, based on his current fitness, 50, 55 minutes tops. Or just bring him on for the last 35, 40 minutes. No more than that. Yeah, and I, I think that's the whole thing. That when this is again the endless pit of social media. When you bring up Suarez, it's that all of Barca's problems because he is that starting forward. That all the problems start with him. But as we've been talking about this game against Celta de Vigo, it's that Barca as a whole. There is a little bit of criticism to be given to each player, and each player is also a tremendous talent. That's why Barca are. Uh, you know, such a top level team and continue to be and will continue to be a top level team. And that's because each of these players individually and collectively are tremendous players, but they all, especially those who are getting older, have weaknesses that teams have figured out how to exploit because there's just too many players that are nearing the end of their careers. And it's a problem that's not going to start and stop from game to game, no matter what any manager might want to do. But I think one of those things is you talk about squad building and I think coming up after the break, we should probably go back and address the Arthur Pionic stuff and talk a little more about squad building. So let's hit that ad break. All right, now time to talk about the unfun stuff. It, as if the Celta de Vigo stuff wasn't uh, devoid of all fun. I think the Arthur uh, Mirlan Pionic swap move that by the time this hits your ears, this might be completely official. It seems like it's already official as we're recording this right after the match against Celta de Vigo. But uh, Frances, I, I think there's two ways to go about this, right? We know that this is a business deal, and I want to explain that. But also, we have to see this from a sporting perspective as well. We know that and can agree that this deal was made for business reasons alone, but it does affect what happens on the field. So I think you're going to cover what's on the field. I'm going to cover what's happening not on the field. So I think maybe you go first, because I think the reaction to whether or not Arthur, because here's the argument, right? That People are saying, as much as we're sad to see a 23, almost 24-year-old go and being replaced by a 30-year-old midfielder and what that could mean, that others are making the argument that, you know, don't cry too much because R2 really wasn't, you know, to, to get him off the books. And it's okay if it had to be done because of business reasons. That to, It's not the worst thing that he was the player that was basically selected or the player that made all this work. And it's not that big of a deal, right? So the, it seems like the argument from a sporting sense is people saying that, you know, it is a great travesty that we've lost Arthur. And then the other part of that is that, well, as much as we want to get upset, it, it could be worse. That Arthur is, is a player that I, I think we have to get over the fact that he might be great for Juventus, but he just wasn't that great for Barca. So I, I think you wrote an article about this on Barcelona.com. So I want to hear uh, where you stand today about what it means to lose Arthur from a sporting sense. Well, I, I pretty much stand where I stood when I wrote the article a couple of days back. I think that um, Artur has had more than enough chances to prove his worth at Barca. Um, he has had, well, two years, really. Um, and that should be enough time when you're 23 years old. And basically, you're not a regular starter, but given enough chances to start here, there and everywhere to, to prove your worth. Um, 
I'm not going to go into too much detail, but it's clear that um, Arthur's life um, beyond football in Barcelona has been a little bit disorderly. Um, I don't want to say any more than that, but trust me, I've got, I've got sources that, um, yeah, they've seen me in action. So bits like that um, obviously influence the fact that he hasn't established himself um, ahead of anybody for a start, to be honest. Uh, the way that the young has done this year, that's not what Arthur has done. And I think that from a sporting perspective, as you mentioned, we cannot be too sad to see Artur go. Obviously, that's given what he has offered and he has shown at the Camp Nou um, since, since he landed. But we got sold an idea when Artur came to the Camp Nou, you know. Um, you've had Messi talking, I think it was within, within pre-season, at the end of pre-season. And he said that, that all of the players that had joined that summer, he was the most impressed with Artur because he reminded him of Xavi. Well, Xavi lasted nearly 20 years in, in Barca, if you count first team and, and obviously Barca B and, and the La Masia years in there. And Artur has lasted, like we say in Spain, un telediario y medio, which is one and a half days. Um, it's not great. Um, it's not a great way to run a club. Um, you've got, you sign youngsters to give them the keys and, and get them de to develop and get them to be sort of carrying the button into the, into the future. Um, I was going to say for better or worse. For worse, we don't have Xavi or Iniesta anymore. We still have Busquets that, you know, he seems to be the only carrier of the Barca DNA of the great Guardiola years. And having had two years alongside Busquets and, and you know, under the influence of of everyone in the Camino dressing room, and Sergio Roberto, Piquet, etc., and not being able to transform that into greatness on the pitch is very disappointing. Um you are going to talk about the business part of this. Um, I think it does make sense to sell him. Um, to be honest and frank and blunt, Artur is not worth 70 million euros. Newsflash for everyone listening. I'm sure they agree. <laughs> He's not worth the money. So selling him for that amount of money makes absolute perfect sense. Now, signing Pjanic straight away for 60 million, in my eyes, does not make sense. But these two players have got inflated prices. Uh, so you could have uh, sold Artur for 15 million and bought Pjanic for five. It's a swap deal. It's a hidden swap deal anyway. Pjanic is not the hardest working player in Juventus. I think that everyone who's watched um, Italian football of late can, can corroborate this. Um, he is creative. He knows how to pass the ball. He's got quite an amount of experience now. He's 30 years old, but, you know, he, he plays into the Messi's timeline is short philosophy. Um, he would be one to come and hit the ground running. I mean, he signed at 30 years old, but then again, so was Terry Henry and Henry Larson was even older than that. And they both, you know, they both ranking very high in all of Kule's hearts uh, because of what they did on the pitch. So I'm not ruling out for one second that Pjanic would be a, a, a great addition for Barca, but obviously when you've got Pedri, Trincao, uh, you've got Ricky Puig, you've got Alanya returning, then those are the minutes that should be given to youngsters to take us to the next level soon enough. And they're going to go to Pjanic because, I mean, I hope I'm wrong, but shifting Rakitic and Vidal out of the squad is going to be very, very difficult. And obviously the young and, and Busquets are, are, are fixes. They're, they're going to be here. So from a sporting perspective, that's all I have to add. Eager to hear what you have to say about finances, Dan. Yeah, well, I would say just from the, to put a, a bow on the sporting part of it, I think it was reckless to try to compare him, but I think what Messi was saying, and I mean, when I watched him at Gremio when he was first linked and I was trying to watch to see what he was bringing, he was a defensive midfielder who would retain possession. And that was the thing that was Xavi-esque. That was the thing that looked like Xavi is that it was hard because of his small stature and the gait in his, in his legs that he looked like Xavi in a way that it was almost impossible to take the ball off him. And that skill remained throughout his whole Barca career. The problem was that he never really got acclimated in any of the other ways. And as we've spoken about before, whether it was things off the field or we also know he had nagging injuries throughout his time for the last year and a half, particularly with his international play. He would get on a plane and seem he would never come back right from his work with Brazil, the Brazilian national team. Part of that, you could argue that if he doesn't sign for Barca, Brazil don't even push him into their starting 11 and don't push him into their national team as quick as they do that the move to Barca actually facilitates his work with the national team. So I, I would, for the, that's the problem with Arthur, that it started well, he showed signs of X, Y, Z, and then people start to yell, Xavi, well, I was promised Xavi, I was promised Xavi, and obviously that's never going to happen. The same thing where I think for me, I want to do my best to say that 
Sure, Puj, as far as being a midfielder with forward thinking and his ability to move the ball and see tight passes in tight spaces, it reminds me of Iniesta in a way that no player has done since Iniesta, but Ricky Puj is not Iniesta full stop. And I think that's what we just, we continue to get ourselves in these messes when we say that this player is the next this, or this is this, and that's what sells papers. That's what gets hit headlines. And, you know, and I think you and I are, you know, we, we're culpable of that too. We, this is what you do because you want to give people a frame of reference as to what they need to look for and why this player might be so promising. But all that said, to put a bow on this for the sporting side, yeah, it's a little bit of a loss, but as you mentioned, the minutes that go to Puj and Alenya and De Young, and as Busquets finishes his career out, I think there is enough talent there and coming into Barcelona and coming into their own who deserve minutes who are ready now for the challenge that I think Barca will find a way to get over losing Artur. And as far as what Pianic will bring in the short term, you're right. He's talented enough, I think, in the short term to be a direct replacement of Artur's talent. And if those even younger players in Artur wind up making the most of their minutes and become even better players, I think they have higher ceilings than the Brazilian does at this point now in his career. Because, yeah, we're going to he's turning 24 in less than a month, I believe. And then we're going to blink and he's going to be 27. And you're going to go, where did all those years go when he was signed at, what, 22 or 21, 22? So I, I think that, you know, that's how he ends his career. But the fact that we're arguing about Artur is the whole problem. Because this has nothing to do with Arter and Pianic, right? That 80 mil and 70 mil, as you mentioned, they don't matter. The reason, or 70 or 60, whatever the final numbers wind up being. So, Diana Christine, a friend of the show, a Barcelona Podcast Hall of Fame all-star for many more than four appearances for Diana Christine. So, she had a beautiful thread. I'm going to be reading it and trying to paraphrase the best I can. But the first note here, I just, uh, I think we need to have a little history lesson here. Football Club de Barcelona, that's what Barcelona is called. FC Barcelona, Football Club de Barcelona. FC Barcelona, Real Madrid, Athletic Club, and Osasuna. In 1990, these were clubs that were profitable in ways that other Spanish football clubs were not. And so those Spanish clubs got turned into corporations, meaning those are basically run through an ownership group as opposed to the club itself, where they, they you vote for administrators and you are a still a football club in the traditional sense as it had been for... 120 years at this point. So that's a really important note here. That's why we can be so critical of the board and we're not just yelling about ownership because you can't really change ownership, but you can vote out a board that you find to be upsetting. I don't mean to pander and I don't mean to, to dumb things down, but it's an important foundation there to start with. So to make sure this is directly from Diana Christine's Twitter thread, to make sure that those clubs are still run properly by the administrators, they had to personally guarantee that 15% of the yearly expenses of that club before taking charge of it. So that means that 15% of it, if the next season's expenditure is way, way, way too high, then that administration needs to cover those profits. So during a board's mandate, if the benefits they have accumulated over the previous seasons make up more than 15% of the next season's expenditure, then they don't need to guarantee anything from that, if that makes any sense. So that basically means, to sum that all up, that for the 2020-21 season, the club is going to end in the red. And then the resulting total profits are a loss on that expenditure. So then the board and the, with that mandate that they are the administrators of the club then have to repay the club to make up for their losses. So too long didn't read or took a nap during that it basically means the club and the administrators, that being the board, what was too much and that overage or the money that was lost more than that 15% is coming out of the board's pocket. And they didn't want to pay that. So... So that they didn't have to pay that, they were able to make this swap deal with Juventus, who are in the same problem, it should be it should be told. They're in the same problem. So when you get a player, that total amount goes on profit. So by getting rid of the contract of Arter for 70 or 80 mil, whatever the final number winds up being, that means that that is a plus 70 to 80 million profit on this year's, you know, final on this year's for the summer of 2020. And the contract of Pianic, uh, Pianic is broken up per the year that he is there. And at the moment, I believe it's a, it's a four-year contract. So it'll be about 17 and a half mil against the bill every year that he's with the club. It's not 80 for 70 or something like that. It's 80 right now and then 17.5 against, meaning they're making up the difference there. So they're going to put themselves back in or they're going to take themselves out of the red at least for this summer. Now, what that means for next year, as they continue to be in the red, well, that's either their problem next year or somebody or, the, or another board's problem. 
So the, the point here is that the board were making this move to save themselves from in, from personally, because of the position they're in as the board, from personally having to pay from being in the red and making all these bad decisions. So they've just made this to make sure that they didn't come, they didn't have to pay personally. And that is why Arthur wound up being the player that was selected. It had nothing to do with Arthur. It had to do with the fact that, again, we've been saying it many times, Rakitic, Vidal, don't fetch that amount. Seems like nobody wants Coutinho, uh, Coutinho for that kind of price. So it seemed like Arthur, even Semedo, we knew that he was out there on the market. Same thing with Umtiti. So Arthur was the player that was young enough where, and you talk about the amount. Is he worth 80 mil? No. But that's basically the limit before FFP goes, hey, that's way too much of a valuation. Because players are, FIFA has some kind of general rule of thumb about players cannot be sold for, right? Like you can't sell, this is a weird example, but if you were going to sell a Manchu for Barcelona B, Barca can't sell him for $150 million and swap him with another player for $140 million to make to balance their books, right? That like that that's what flags FFP. That's what flags these organizations to say, whoa, whoa, whoa. But Arthur, the limit that you could sell him for, like the maximum would be 80 million. And then Pionic, same thing for 70 mil. So this balances and Juventus is doing the exact same thing on their side. Okay. For any listeners who are still <laughs> with us, thank you and congratulations <laughs> for <laughs> You've done it. <laughs> Enduring that explanation. Uh, you get a gold star coming especially from Qatar, sent my way uh, with all of my strength. No, jokes aside, it's, uh, it's silly, isn't it? I mean, we shouldn't have to be talking about this. We should just have to be focusing on the, on the sporting part. And uh, Barca is a football club. Therefore, everything that we do should be based on sporting benefit. Obviously, uh, things are different. And I think that the socios need to do everything within their power to, you know, analyze the situation, um, evaluate what this board has brought in terms of positives and negatives, and then and then decide. You know, unfortunately, a, a lot of people listening to this podcast won't have a say. It's going to be the sources deciding, and they are the ones that you know they're easily influential uh, because of the many years of voting, pretty much the same train of thought with you know Roussel and obviously Bartomeu, and obviously those two come from the Josep Luis Nunez. Um, school of thinking really so there's going to be it's going to be difficult uh, for anybody to come to come and break through but um absolutely we should not be in this position i mean no one could see the the pandemic coming up obviously otherwise we'd have done something about it but it's um it's really really sad times when in a club that barca that you know have got over 100 years of history which is a football in history we're having to take decisions to to hurt the sporting part of the club just because the you know, those in charge of the club haven't done their homework in terms of finances. It's really, really sad to hear. Yeah, I think that there isn't too much more to say. As I said, there, we're left with trying to figure out how Pionic fits and what the loss of Arthur means. And that's kind of what you see people, especially on social media. Like, as I said, I'm confused myself as I'm explaining it. And I also would like to say that if anybody, <laughs> in my total explanation, yeah, I think it's a confusing thing. And if you got more information to add or something to even clarify or correct me with, please hit us up, send us an email let us know or DM us on Twitter as well. And I'll make sure to fix that in next week's show because it is complicated and there is a business side of it. And you're right that we as kool aids especially, again, those who don't get to vote as socios, you know, we're just kind of have to take this in and understand it in a sporting sense and, and try to make sense of that. Because from a financial side, we've been talking about this many times before, that Antoine Griezmann from Atletico Madrid, as we're transitioning to talk about them in the preview, but to get him from Atletico Madrid, it's not even about the fact that, you know, he made a little bit of the mockery of the club the year before, meaning he was a year older when he came to Barca. Not, not, I mean, we're not even talking about the fact that he hasn't made things work or he doesn't fit in the club, because even if he did fit in the club and he'd already scored 20 goals so far this year, he still would have the second highest wages on the team and his wages wouldn't have made sense when he was signed. Unless he was signing another version of Messi, it didn't make any sense to pay a player as much as they do pay weekly wages. And that's, again, I've yet to even speak about the, the big money, the transfer fee for him, which is $120 million. We're just talking about the wages. We're just talking about how much he costs the club week to week, which is an insane amount of money and an impossible amount of money for that kind of player to be brought in. So he was brought in from a marketing sense as well because he was a top player in Europe and he was a Ballon d'Or top three finisher in the last three years. And so you put him up there and say that he's going to sell a lot of jerseys and the marketing aspect is going to help out. But it seems like it, it doesn't. 
And what if he comes to Barca and his star power does not follow because he stopped being a star and he takes his back seat? Well, then you're not going to get the marketing returns either. The same thing happened with Coutinho. Big star in Brazil. You always want a big Brazilian to sell a lot of jerseys and things work out. But if you keep failing on these Brazilian, Brazilian transfers and you're not selling the jerseys, then their transfer fees and their wages are just going to count against you. Yeah, so, I mean, we're almost wrapped up with it, Frances, but anything more to get off your chest? No, just to say that obviously Barca haven't spent any more money the, the proper way. Um, I think that if we had gotten the signings of Dembele, Griezmann and Coutinho spot on, then we would be in a much better position today. We wouldn't need to be chasing Neymar to come back or Lautaro or anything like that. Um, Dembele would be healthy, so he would have been starting and, you know, there wouldn't have been any problem whatsoever in there. Um, Coutinho would have sorted the midfield, uh, the interior sort of uh, vacancies here and there and everywhere. And just those three signings just really haven't haven't worked at all. Um, obviously, can you blame three people for what the club is today? No, but obviously they should have played a much more important part in, in the last two, three years, uh, and they just simply haven't. Not to say that there's been a lot of other signings done unnecessarily, players signed for you know, 30, 35, 40 million. I, I can remember top of my head, Andre Gomes, for example. Um, Neto, to be honest, um, not really adding much at all, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that the, the top signings haven't worked out and the middle class signings, which in my eyes shouldn't have happened in the beginning, you know, because you should have trusted La Masia graduates and, you know, run with them like we do with Puch and Ansu right now. Um, that have taken us where we are today. And as I said before, it's... It's, it's gotten, it's, it's really sad. Yeah, and so that leads you to this point where you're trying to talk and focus about the match that just happened, but you know that there are, are much bigger looming difficulties ahead. And speaking of difficulties ahead, this Celta de Vigo draw looks even worse through the lens that Atletico Madrid, uh, Atletico Madrid is just a few days away. I just want to quickly preview them. For those who haven't been watching, they're not really playing great either. And now I know that you say they play ugly, but usually they play ugly and get results, and even that's not happening. They're going to be lucky to finish top three or top four. It might just happen that enough clubs around them drop points that they wind up slipping into top three or top four. But that said, yeah, Atletico Madrid has not been great. But the way they have been going about their season is something that actually has been, since they got back from the break in particular, I think is going to be a real challenge. And this one, not even ugly, but this could be... I, not to say, but I've got a pit in my stomach thinking this might be the first really nasty blowout loss for Barca in quite some time. Just because I know Barca's defense is, is good, but Atletico Madrid, the way they're constructed, matches up really well against Barca in that up top, they're starting Marcos Llorente, who you might remember was a kind of Real Madrid cast off. He bounced around on loan in the Liga, but now he starts up top with Diego Costa in a 4 4 2. And by starting basically a defensive midfielder who's turned into an attacking midfielder, by starting him up top in a 4-4-2, they bring that pressure. And that means if Barca have any mistake and bring, and turn the ball over, they're going to be destroyed on the counter. And they might not even start, that being Diego Simeone, he might not even start Diego Costa. And he might go with Alvaro, Alvaro Morata, who leads them with Atletico Madrid with nine goals. Just because he's just he's quicker to a first ball. Neither Diego Costa, good thing for Barca, neither Costa or Morata are very quick. They're generally two of the slower center forwards in La Liga, but they can get on the end of a ball, much like Suarez, and they can put something in there. I'm interested to see if on the left midfield, it's either Yannick Carrasco, who is the more defensive one, or the very young Zhao Felix. Speaking of 120 million euro transfers, uh, Zhao Felix could get the start. In the midfield, you're going to see Thomas Partey, most likely partnering with Salul, and then you're going to have Jan Oblak in net. So, Frances, I'm just looking at this one. It's going to be an ugly one. Diego Simeone is going to make it ugly, and I'm worried that Barca, with Messi playing every minute of the Liga action so far since they returned, and this team just not having the bench they need. If they're not going to trust in the Manchu and Callado, who they've been on the bench for a long time, if you're not going to trust some of those younger players who might get punched in the mouth against Lego Madrid, you know that Diego Simeone's side is going to knock Messi around for 10 rounds. This is going to be an ugly one, and I don't think I've looked forward to a match less than I am this one against Atletico Madrid on Tuesday. Yeah, for sure. But at the same time, I don't think there are many culés that are really looking forward to much anymore this season. Um, I don't want to be too pessimistic. At the time of recording, Espanyol and Real Madrid haven't played yet. Um, I would assume Real Madrid win because uh, Espanyol are just terrible and, you know, Luckily for, well, not luckily, but, you know, I'm not, I'm not too distraught that they're on the way to second division, um, to be honest. 
And no, I, I just think that Barca need to trust on their own strengths, you know, and that's all we can do. We, we, I don't want to be in a point in which Barca are scared of any other team in La Liga rather than, not scared, but, you know, being respectful of Real Madrid and Sevilla, Valencia, and obviously Atletico. And, and this is going to be another, you know, terrible, terribly exciting battle. Uh, they always are against Atletico. They are an aggressive team and they're going to come and they're going to come and hunt us. Obviously, you just previewed all the, you know, the, the recent form and, and which players to watch for, as always, excellent work there. Um, but I think that from a Barca perspective, we just need to do what we do. Um, I know we didn't win in, Fel in Vigo against Delta, but, you know, there were a lot of things that were good. Uh, I think that the eruption of Ansu Fati and Ricky Pucci is, is great. I think the fact that um, Leo Messi, I know he will be tired, but, you know, Messi has always played over the last 10 years, always played whenever he wanted to play, which is all the time. Um, I thought he was he was good enough in in, in terms of um, connection and passing and, and finding his teammates. He's not been too effective from free kicks lately, but, you know, hopefully that, that will change sometime soon. Suarez is not fit to play the 90 minutes, but to play a good 50, 55, 60, I think he's he's perfectly capable of doing that. Um, Busquets will come back. That would generate some more legs in the midfield, maybe for Rakitic to come on or Vidal to sort of alternate some, some time in there. Uh, Barca will play at the Camp Nou. You know, we've won, I think it's 46 out of 48 points at the Camp Nou this season. So I think that, of course, we need to be respectful of Atletico. But honestly, I think that at home, Barca are a completely different team. I think it's more of a psychological thing when they go away, to be honest. And uh, I think we could beat Atletico at home. Not easily, of course. Not, we could never, even during the Guardiola years, we were never able to beat, to beat Atletico easily. But I think that we can certainly come away with the three points. Because I, don't, I don't have a doubt about that at all. Yeah. Now, I, I don't want to start a big discussion here, but I think the way I want to wrap this show up is then after Atletico Madrid, I want to mention this Villarreal after that, who have been the best team so far in terms of points gained since the restart. So credit to Villarreal for playing so well, and the Yellow Submarine is going to be another tough test. But you mentioned the home uh, success for Barca this year, and you're right about that. They've been great at the Camp Nou, whether it was under Valverde or under Kike Setien. But Kike Setien, if it was just on the home record, you'd say, oh, he deserves another summer. It's going to be good. It's, he's got Puj and Fati, and he's incorporating them, and there are good things to see. You'd hope that he can get some transfers that he wants in. Just look at some of the, the road results he had. He had a draw against Napoli. He had a loss to Real Madrid in El Clasico, a draw against Sevilla, a draw against Celta de Vigo. And with Kike Setien not coming up big in those matches, I don't know. I, what, what's the grade? I'm not going to say... I don't want to make conjecture whether at this moment in time we can say whether or not he's going to be fired over the summer or whether or not he deserves another year. So I, don't, I know you usually answer that way. I don't want that answer. What I want is in the very moment from the minute he took over in January until just this 2-2 draw against Celta de Vigo, from A to F, what grade would you give Kike Setien? Myself, I would give him a C. I would pass him, to be honest, based on the fact that the previous manager who had won the previous Ligas wasn't doing much more with the same squad either. If you, you, know, you, you can only be as good as the tools you have um, and the tools you have, not, not in terms of their CVs, not in terms of their you know, trophy cabinets, not in terms of how many goals they scored in 2015, but what you're faced with now, I don't think Setien is being terrible. I think Setien is being as good as Valverde was, which wasn't very good, obviously. Um, he's at least trusting the youngsters a little bit more. He's at least trying to create a little bit more than Valverde ever was. The games are more watchable, to be honest. So from that perspective, I wouldn't want to fail him. I'm not going to give him a B or an A or an A plus, of course. But um, I think I think the problem is not the manager as such. It's, it's the ingredients, the, the the lack of hunger, the lack of the lack of ability that the players seem to have to adapt to what the manager is asking from them. And, and you know, having taken the reins of the team halfway through a season, I don't want to fail Kike Setien just yet. He's got another seven matches. Hopefully, he can prove me right and increase his grade rather than you know go straight into a fail. Speaking of managers and trying to end this on a positive note, apparently news is coming out of Catalonia that Garcia Pimienta, that being Francisco Garcia Pimienta, the manager of Barcelona B, a contract renewal could be coming next week for him, which I think is good news. And I watch enough Barca B to tell you that Manchu in almost every other club in the world would already be breaking into the first team. Callado would deserve first team minutes almost everywhere else. Araujo has, has honestly improved 
from when I first saw him come into Barca B. So Garcia Pimienta, to his credit, is getting players prepared to make the step. And that means that you've got to... And he also is in a good position to at least get Barcelona. They had made the promotion playoffs. We'll see how that all shakes out. But whether or not he gets promoted to the second division and gets Barca B up, uh, I think he's just done a tremendous job at Barca B. So I'm really glad to hear that he's going to get a contract renewal. So he gets a little spicy. Sure. I'm personally eager to see how that translates into the first team. And going back to what we were just mentioning, I think that if Setien has been, you know, he's taken eight to nine Barca B players to every single game in the last month, to be honest. So, so that's, that's, that's a positive. I want to see them sort of transfer and make the jump into the first team. But, you know, it's those mammoth contracts from players like Rakitic or Vidal that, that, that basically can be shipped out. That's the problem. And, you know, I could list more. Junior Firpo, for example. I mean, are you serious that there's not a single Barca B player that can do what he's doing, which is playing 15 minutes every two, three matches? I mean, I'm not going to keep, keep mentioning Cucurella, but, you know, there's got to be someone else in Barca B that can do that job. So that's what I want to see. I want to see... The Barca B youngsters making the leap to the first team, proving the worth, being trusted and making an impact. And if there has to be playing, I don't know, 20 minutes every three matches, then so be it until they continue to earn and develop and listen to what the manager wants them to do. And from that from that perspective, yes, continuity of the manager, manager would make sense. But obviously, if Setien is disastrous in the remaining seven weeks, he's not really going to have that chance. Yeah, I want, I'm going to finish with a pretty hot take. I usually don't have these, but... As much as you want to say be happy about Puj and Fati getting their chances, with Artur basically having played his last minute, and maybe this was his swan song and everybody can clap it up when he came on and Barca wound up getting, you know, falling into a draw against Celta de Vigo, I, again, watched Manchu all year. And even though he hasn't played in four months and hasn't played an actual match in four months, I think those last, what it was, 10 to 12 minutes that Artur got at the end of this game against Celta de Vigo... I've seen what Manchu has done this year, and I know the third division and Celta de Vigo are different, but those were his minutes today. And I think that's the big difference. That I know I'm supposed to be happy about Puj, that, oh, I'm glad that we got one player in the midfield to get some time. But uh, yeah, I think Manchu deserved the minutes more than Artur did. So there you go. There's your hot take to end it. And I guess that's the end of Artur potentially at Barcelona too. And to finish it off, this is the end of this show. So I want to thank you so much for listening in, particularly that middle part when I talked about the business of the Arthur deal. So thanks so much again for tuning in. You can tap in your app and check out the show notes to subscribe. You can find us on social media, on Twitter, at the Barcelona Pod, or at Hilton D13 for me, on Instagram, at the Barcelona Pod. Closed Facebook group is tbpod.link backslash group. Deeper dives and discussions, as you know. You can also help us out on Patreon, where I usually do a quick take match review, but... You know, if I'm doing a YouTube video or if we're having the show recording right after, you might say things a little bit different over there. We're also on YouTube at the Barcelona Podcast. Check us out there. I also do tactical match reviews a little more, uh, a little different than what happens here as well as some other content. So that's all on YouTube. But as always, thanks so much for listening to this. This is the main thing. This is the big show we do every week. So thanks so much for listening to the Barcelona Podcast. Until next time, we'll talk to you soon. Barcelona. Barcelona.